Well, as you know, <coughs> we've been teaching in uh, the first epistle of John. <coughs> and <coughs> recently, we've been looking at some Bible certainties regarding sin. <coughs> it's one of the early things discussed <coughs> in and throughout the epistle of 1 John. <coughs> And we were looking last week at what the Bible says regarding the confession of sin. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, that word confession, it means the same thing, to say the same thing as, or to agree. <clears throat> confession of sin then means <clears throat> to say the same thing about our sin that God says about it. <clears throat> to agree with God regarding our sins. <clears throat> and so then, obviously, before you can agree with God regarding your sins, you've got to know what God says about sin. So we'll briefly consider a few sections of Scripture that tell us God's view on our sins, looking at Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> familiar passage of Scripture to many Christians. <clears throat> Verse 10 says, as it is written, and let me just stop there for a moment. <clears throat> That, that phrase, as it is written, that's a phrase that you find uh, throughout the scripture. Uh, and when you find it, what it means is the Bible is quoting itself. Uh, uh, that, uh, that the uh, human author who wrote it is quoting something that's already been written in the Bible. So these verses here in uh, Romans chapter 3, for, for example, come from uh, verses written in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, and it says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, not one. <clears throat> There's a verse to consider for those who think that they can be good enough uh, to, to earn their way into heaven. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. Verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, boy, if that's not a characteristic uh, of our culture in this day and age, I don't know what else would be. There's no fear of God before their eyes. In verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, God is saying everyone is a sinner. Everyone. <clears throat> Do you agree with God that you too are a sinner? Because <clears throat> if not, First John 1 John 1.8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And in verse 10, it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. <clears throat> serious, serious business when it comes to this matter of sin. <clears throat> God tells us, that everyone, absolutely everyone, uh, is a sinner. And for a human being to say that they're not a sinner, <clears throat> well, they're calling God a liar. Yeah. <clears throat> the problem oftentimes is, is that people will think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Well, hold on to that thought, because we'll be looking deeper into that. <clears throat> what exactly are sins? <coughs> Is it more than just breaking the Ten Commandments? <clears throat> Most people think when they think about sins, <clears throat> they think about breaking the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and they generally think, well, okay, they haven't kept them per uh, perfectly, but they're not too bad. <clears throat> and as I've heard preachers say from time to time, just consider a few of them. <clears throat> Thou shalt not lie. How many lies have you told in your lifetime? Well, if the answer is one or more, God says that makes you a liar. The <clears throat> Bible tells us not to take the name of the Lord in vain. <clears throat> How many times has that happened in your life? <clears throat> that would make you a blasphemer. The Bible says, <clears throat> thou shalt not steal. Have you ever taken anything in your life? Ever downloaded music from the internet <clears throat> that you didn't pay for? Uh, <clears throat> ever taken anything even as a child <clears throat> that you didn't pay for? That would make you a thief. <clears throat> uh, Jesus said, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, <clears throat> that's the same thing as adultery. You ever look at another person with lust in your heart? I mean, just that, That's only four commandments, and it would say, <clears throat> you're a liar, you're a thief, 
you're a blasphemer, and you're an adulterer. <clears throat> but it's even more than that. First John chapter four, I'm sorry, first John chapter three, verse ten tells us whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So committing a sin definitely includes breaking God's commandments, <clears throat> but there's plenty of other places in the Bible <clears throat> where it gets very specific. <clears throat> For example, in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23, Jesus himself is speaking on the subject of sin and gets very specific about it. He's saying, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For, for from within, out of the heart of men, <clears throat> proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, which means unbridled lust, an evil eye, just looking at something or someone with evil intent, blasphemy, pride. Well, everybody's hearing, we're in pride month, where pride is to be um, <clears throat> demonstrated <clears throat> in the most ungodly and awful way imaginable, and yet God puts pride in his list of sins. <clears throat> pride month, I guess you could call it sin month because that's what it really is. And foolishness, which just means thoughtlessness. <clears throat> how often and how easy it for, is it for us to do something or say th something that's just simply thoughtless? <clears throat> Verse 23, he says, All these evil things come from within and defile the man. <clears throat> Not only are there sins that we commit, <clears throat> so, such as those that we just looked at, but James chapter 4, verse 17 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> Therefore, there are sins that we commit by failing to do something that we should have done. <clears throat> and here's something to consider regarding agreeing with God about sin. <clears throat> For those who think, well, I'm not really that bad. I haven't been that bad. I've never murdered anybody. <clears throat> Consider this. What would be the greatest sin you could commit? And most people off the top of their head would say something like murder, <clears throat> maybe adultery, maybe blasphemy. But God's answer would be the greatest sin would be to break the greatest commandment. And Jesus was asked about that. <clears throat> what is the greatest commandment? <clears throat> and we find in Matthew chapter 22, <coughs> excuse me, beginning of verse 35 says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting or testing him, and saying, Master, speaking to Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? So this lawyer <coughs> comes to Jesus, tries to test him, says, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus doesn't even hesitate. Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. God's greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. <clears throat> Every single bit <clears throat> of your heart, soul, and mind dedicated <clears throat> to the love of God every moment of every day for your entire life. That's the commandment. That's the commandment. Do you do that? When you're angry? Do you cuss or take God's name in vain? Are you doing that? And when you look with lust in your heart at another person, when you tell a lie, are you doing that? <clears throat> My friend, <clears throat> We break God's greatest commandment every single day of our life, every one of us, <clears throat> including me. But because I've turned <clears throat> from religion and turned from thinking that <clears throat> I could be good enough to earn heaven and have placed my trust in Jesus Christ alone to get me into heaven, I am born again and my sins are forgiven. If you've done that, then you are born again, and your sins are forgiven. <coughs> but somebody who's not done that, if they spend the rest of their life living without coming to Christ, <clears throat> without agreeing with him 
regarding their sinful and their hopeless condition, then they're going to face God as one who spent their lifetime committing the greatest sin they could ever commit in God's eyes. <clears throat> and we can certainly say it'll go horribly bad for them when they stand before God. <clears throat> How much longer does somebody have to make things right? <clears throat> somebody who doesn't know Christ, <clears throat> they've been living without him, apart from him, <clears throat> in contradiction to him, defying him. How much longer do they have <clears throat> to do what I and probably all of you and millions of others have done? And that is to agree with God regarding their sinful condition, their inability to save themselves through their good deeds, and to accept that Christ's death on the cross was in payment for their sins, to accept him alone as their Savior, to humble themselves before him as their Lord. How long do they have? <coughs> well, of course, no one but God knows the definitive answer to that question for each person. <coughs> but that's the subject that we're con considering right now. <clears throat> Last time, we were looking at a specific event in the history of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> this event, which we'll return to in a minute, contains a vital truth that everyone needs to understand regarding confession of sin. It's vital because it gives us some insight <clears throat> into God's patience when dealing with the unrepentant. <clears throat> Those who have refused to humble themselves before God who have refused to agree with him regarding their sins, who continue to ignore or defy his commandments, or who pick and choose which commandments they want to follow and those that they don't. Does God's patience run out? <clears throat> so let's look back at that portion of Scripture where we ended last time. It's in Joshua chapter 7, the sixth book of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 7. <clears throat> Now, let me do something a little different than usual. <clears throat> Everybody has seen TV shows or movies that start out with some kind of cataclysmic event going on, uh, explosions and car wrecks or who knows what, what's going on, but some kind of cat cataclysmic event that doesn't even seem to make any sense to you whatsoever. And then the screen will show 72 hours earlier, and they begin a flashback to tell you everything that led up to what you just saw. <clears throat> so we're going to kind of do that this way <clears throat> this morning. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what I consider to be a stunning event in the Bible that may make little or no sense to you, and then we'll do a flashback of what led up to the event to put it in proper context. <clears throat> so in Joshua chapter 7, <clears throat> let's begin at verse number 19. It says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, Glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. <clears throat> and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Verse 24, <clears throat> And Joshua and all Israel took him, took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought him into the valley of Achor. <clears throat> and Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. Wow. Wow. Joshua confronts Achan regarding his sin before God, and Achan confesses. He pours out the whole story. He admits to his sin. He agrees with God regarding his sin. He says the same thing as God regarding his sin. Achan confesses, and Joshua and the whole nation of Israel take him to a nearby valley and stone him to death. And not just him. They stone his wife. They stone his sons. They stone his daughters. They even kill his oxen and his donkeys and his sheep. Then they burn his remains and the remains of his whole family <clears throat> and his animals. And they even burn his tent. 
And all this happened after he confessed his sin, after he agreed with God that he had sinned. Wow. Does that strike you as maybe a little harsh or maybe a, a lot harsh? Well, I have to confess that until recently, it struck me that way. <clears throat> Every time I read this story, I couldn't help but wonder why God ordered the death of Achan and his whole family and the destruction of everything he had after he confessed and admitted to his sin. <clears throat> I mean, after all, aren't you supposed to get pardon <clears throat> if you do that? <clears throat> I mean, we've read... Uh, Every week for at least the last month or so, First John 1, 9, which tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why was there no forgiveness for Achan or his family? And this is the part where the screen shows 72 hours earlier. <clears throat> We're going to do the flashback and see what led up to the annihilation of Achan and his family. <clears throat> Israel had wandered in the wilderness between the promised land and Egypt for 40 years, and now it was time for them to enter the promised land. And Moses has died, Joshua is now leading the people, and Joshua receives instructions from God on how to take the first city that they're going to encounter when they come in to the promised land, the city of Jericho. <coughs> they follow the instructions and receive a tremendous victory destroying and taking uh, Jericho. But <clears throat> this happened in chapter 6, and God gave the nation a specific instruction regarding their conquest of Jericho. <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 17 and 18, God is giving his instructions, and he says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Verse 18, And ye... In any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. So God tells them, no spoil. You may not take any spoil from Jericho. <clears throat> so they take the city. Then at, at chapter 7, after that great victory at Jericho, they come to the little town of Ai. <clears throat> and... They're so certain they're, they're going to be able to conquer Ai easily that they don't even send the entire army. <clears throat> they send a part of the army to Ai, and Ai soundly defeats them. We don't know how many Israelites died in that, but they soundly defeated <clears throat> the army of Israel. And it's verse 1 of chapter 7 that tells us why. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 6 of chapter 7 tells us that Joshua tore his clothes. It's a sign of grief. It says he fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads, which was a, a recognition of their humiliation. <clears throat> Verse 7 and Joshua said, <clears throat> Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. <clears throat> so the Lord says to Joshua, verse 10, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. They lied and have put it even among their own stuff. <clears throat> Again, they've been told you can't take any spoil. This victory cannot degenerate into looting. <clears throat> That's not the spirit of this mission. <clears throat> but as we saw in verse 1, they didn't obey. <clears throat> Achan had taken some of the things God had forbidden, hid them uh, in his... Uh, tent, <clears throat> lied about it. Verse 12, Therefore the children of Israel cannot stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you, up 
Sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken uh, with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrongfully wrought folly, and he, because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So God tells Joshua, we're going to sift through the tribes, then through the families, then through the households, and I'll show you the guilty party. Now the question is, why this prolonged, dragged out process? You ever wonder about that? I mean, God certainly could have simply told Joshua, Achan did it, he's the one. But he didn't do that. Instead, he prescribed this long, drawn-out process. First, we're going to find the tribe that contains the guilty party, <clears throat> and then the family that contains the guilty party, and then the household that contains the guilty party, and man by man until we get to the guilty party. Why? Why did God use this prolonged, dragged-out process? It's because he's patient with sinners for as long as his patience lasts. He's merciful with the unrepentant for as long as his mercy lasts, which I'll explain more in a minute. Verse 16, <clears throat> So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, <clears throat> and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, <clears throat> and he took the family of the Zerites, and he brought the family of the Zerites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought... <clears throat> his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So God identifies Achan as the man <coughs> through this long, drawn-out process that probably took hours. And we come to verse 19, and I want you to notice how it's stated. Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now, what thou hast done, hide it not from me. <clears throat> saying, give glory to God. Is he, is he saying, well, you know, just sing a praise chorus and it'll be okay. No. Is he saying, just worship God and, and everything will be all right? Of course not. He's saying, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. Give praise to him and here's how. Tell him what you've done. Confess your sin. Don't hide it. We see here that one of the ways in which we glorify God is by the confession of our sin. You might think, oh, how does that glorify God? If I really want to glorify God, I simply won't sin. Doesn't that make more sense? Well, if we were capable of doing that, it certainly would. But when we sin, we glorify God by agreeing with him that we have failed. Achan knew what it meant. It says, Achan answered Joshua, verse 20, and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done, when I saw him on the spoils, a, a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they're hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. And he told exactly what he did. <clears throat> verse 22, So Joshua sent messengers. They ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in the tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and brought them into the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble, by the way. Verse 25, And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned his the uh, fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. So Achan confesses his sin and God orders his death along with everybody involved. There was obviously complicity within his entire family 
<clears throat> to receive these goods and hide them uh, in their tent. His sons knew, his daughters knew <clears throat> what was going on. And Achan confesses the, his defiance of God's law, and Joshua and Israel kill them. But Achan admitted what he did. He confessed. Doesn't that gain him forgiveness, a pardon, the mercy of God? It does not. Why? Because God had already given Achan and his entire family the chance to gain the mercy and forgiveness of God through that long, drawn-out process of identifying Achan as the guilty party. <clears throat> they marched the tribes past. Achan saw the tribe of Judah was chosen. And in his mind, and in the minds of his family members, they thought, that's our tribe. Oh no, that's our tribe. God knows it's me. He could have confessed right then and there and thrown himself on the mercy of God, but he didn't. Then he saw from the tribe of Judah the family of the Zerites get chosen, and he knew that Zerah was his grandfather, and he was part of that family. He could have confessed right then, but he didn't. His wife could have cried out for forgiveness, but she didn't. His sons and his daughters knew God was narrowing in on them. They could have fallen down before Joshua and Israel and God Almighty and confessed, but they didn't. They continued to be defiant. Then Achan and his family saw that the family of Zabdi, Achan's father, was chosen. <clears throat> and even then, it was still possible for him to fall on his face before God and the nation of Israel, confess what he did, and beg for the mercy of God, but he didn't. Neither did his family. They continued in defiance. They continued their deception. They continued to hide their sin. It was not until Achan was specifically identified as the guilty party did he admit to his sin, and then it was finally too late. God's patience had run out. His mercy had run out. See, Achan did not ever show genuine repentance, which is godly sorrow. Remember 2 Corinthians 7.10? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. If Achan showed anything, it was sorrow for being caught. But no sign whatsoever of godly sorrow for having sinned against God. <clears throat> so God was merciful for as long as he could be. But neither Achan nor his family were repentant. <clears throat> and Achan, upon Joshua's urging, did confess his sin. He finally admitted it. After all attempts to hide it failed, and the blame couldn't be shifted to anybody else. So God was glorified <clears throat> when Achan confessed his sin. Because Achan was admitting that God was righteous and that Achan had transgressed against him. But Achan's confession did not come from a repentant heart. God had offered mercy. <clears throat> God had offered the chance for forgiveness. But Achan would not repent, even though he did confess. <clears throat> you see the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness is because we, as a truly born-again believer, have already come to true biblical repentance. Meaning, <clears throat> having godly sorrow for being a sinner and receiving the forgiveness of God as our permanent possession. Achan didn't have that. Achan didn't have that. And the Bible tells us that one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord, and yet the vast majority of those people are going to be unsaved people. Confession by itself, when it doesn't come with a repentant heart, saves nobody. Saves nobody. And Achan is a demonstration of that. <clears throat> if you're in sin, if somebody listening to me on the internet right now, if they're in sin, God has drawn a line in your life. And no one but God knows where it is or how close you are to it. But if you cross it, there's no coming back. God's patience has run out. His mercy has run out. And the consequences are always extreme. Always extreme. God is merciful. God is patience. But those things are not without their limit. <clears throat> So let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished for today.